So we are right in the transition of uh, winter and spring here on the farm, and it's a very exciting time for everybody. It's a time of new beginnings. It's a time to invest and build new infrastructure. It's also the wrap-up of conference season. And conference season for farmers, is it's a really important time. It is nice. It allows us to maybe network and socialize for the first time in maybe months because farming can be a very solitary and lonely job. And it also allows us to get caught up with the latest research techniques on farming methods that are out there, either tested on the university or on farm level. An unfortunate recurrence that I've been noticing, though, from all these gatherings is that they can also be a hotbed for spreading bad agricultural techniques and misinformation. And the one that has been popping up around a lot, at least in my world of uh, organic fruits and vegetables is something called BRICS theory. Because I think it's one of the most dangerous types of misinformation that's out there. And that's misinformation that is based within a kernel of truth. And what I've noticed what charlatans will do is that they will take that kernel of truth, they'll sensationalize it into something that's completely different and totally untrue, and then try to profit off of that sensationalization. Pretty sure that's a word. So let's take a step back here and discuss Brooks theory a little more closely. Let's take it back to the red shed. You knew this was coming. Now, before we delve into Brooks theory itself, let's take a step back and talk about what Brooks actually is. Brooks is a unit of measurement, just like feet, inches, or centimeters, but instead of measuring length, bricks measure something called total soluble solids, or the amount of soluble solids within a liquid. And we use it a lot in the fruit and vegetable world, um, because let's say you take a strawberry or a raspberry and squeeze it and get all of the juice out of it. When you measure the total soluble solids, the vast majority of those are going to be sugars. So in general, for fruit, the higher the bricks, the sweeter the fruit will actually be. Okay, now that we know what bricks is, let's talk about this kernel of truth that the overarching nonsense is based off of, and that's nutrient management. Now, there's a countless number of articles over the course of several decades and decades confirming that, much like humans, you and me, plants that have proper nutrients are going to be better off than plants that don't get their proper nutrients. This being better off can show itself in higher yields or increased um, resistance to pests or diseases. And this makes sense. I mean, if you're not getting your proper cocktail of nutrients in the food that you eat, you're probably going to be a little bit more sickly. And if you're more sickly, then you have a higher chance of actually getting sick. Now, it's also true that plants that are more sickly are going to have, in general, a harder time making their sugars than a plant that has all of its nutrients. So everything else being equal, a plant that is healthier and has better nutrient management is going to be sweeter than a plant that is sickly. It's also true that plants that are more sickly are going to have a harder time making their sugars than a plant that has all of its nutrients. So everything else being equal, a plant that is healthier and has better nutrient management is going to be sweeter than a plant that is sickly. In general, that idea is true, and it supports why having healthy soils with a rich reserve of nutrients is so important. Okay, now let's get to the nonsense part. Brick's theory charlatans have taken these truths of nutrient management and sensationalized them out into two primary pseudoscience mistruths. And that's one, that you can use bricks alone to 
sum up the total health of the entire plant. And two, that plants that have high, high bricks content are going to be virtually immune to every single pest and disease. And let's think about this in human terms for a second. If I came up to you and said that having a body temperature of 98.6 degrees was in general a good indicator of your overall current health, that would make sense. But if I said that having a body temperature of 98.6 meant that you were completely healthy in every way, you didn't need to take any other tests of your health, and not only that, but if you have that temperature, you will never get sick ever again, you'd get skeptical that I was taking those truths of body temperature and sensationalizing it out into something completely different. Calling these bricks theorists charlatans, you know, Andy, isn't that a little bit harsh? But the reason why I keep bringing it up is because this past winter I performed a little bit of a literature review after these conferences with the goal of trying to compile every single source I could find that was pro bricks theory and every single source I could find that advocated or warned against bricks theory. And here's the summary of what I found. Every single pro bricks theory source I could find made scientific claims about bricks theory but provided no citations of any of the research or trials that went into making those claims. Most of them would refer back to one man, Dr. Kerry Reams, a person in the early 1900s who claimed to hold six PhDs but didn't provide documentation of any of them and was eventually jailed in Georgia for practicing medicine without a license. Every single source I could find also tried to sell you something that was pro bricks theory, whether it be a boxed DVD set or sugar-laced fertilizers. Conversely, every anti bricks theory source that I could found provided plenty of citations backing up their scientific claims, and none of them were trying to sell you anything. The last conference I was at back in February, I was presenting at a session and someone in the audience stood up and said that none of his raspberries had spotted wing drosophila and that all raspberries that have high bricks don't have spotted wing drosophila at all. He then proceeded to pass out brochures for his bricks theory fertilizer that he was trying to sell. And that's what makes me upset. Everyone that came to that conference that that session was there because they were suffering, because they are dealing with spotted wing drosophila and it's an incredibly dangerous pest for most small fruits and they were there looking for answers. And BRICS theorists will come with a silver bullet solution and try to profit off of other people's desperation. That's what makes me so upset because I see my brothers and sisters getting taken advantage of from charlatans. That's what they are. All right, everyone. It's been a hot minute since that last shot, as you can probably tell, based on my awesome quarantine hair, according to, like, everyone but my wife. Waiting on some more supplies, and before that gets delivered, I figured I'd try and wrap up this video on bricks theory. And I wanted to wrap it up with something constructive, right? Like, I've spent a whole lot of time lambasting these bricks theorists and nothing bugs you more than just, you know, trying to take someone else down without providing a solution for yourself. So, you know, Andy, what's, what are some strategies that I can take to protect myself from the tasty allures of my local charlatan? And that's obviously going to depend on a case-by-case -case basis, but I think as long as you just hold yourself to these three guidelines, you can usually be able to parse out actual good data from something that is intended to deceive you. Guideline number one, always be skeptical of an argument or a viewpoint if it's being supported with exclusively anecdotal evidence. And what I mean by anecdotal is evidence that is based just on a story or if it's based on just observations and there wasn't any hard data taken to support it. So let's say a farmer comes up to you and says, hey, I tried this practice on my farm last year and it worked great, so you should use it too. And it may have worked great, but if that practice wasn't compared against any other practices, or if that practice wasn't compared against a control practice where maybe the practice wasn't used, or any host of other things that required sort of hard data collection, 
it's really hard to draw a conclusion based on that observation. So it doesn't mean that the practice didn't work, it just means that it's hard to turn that into a recommendation for other people. Guideline number two, you should be skeptical if the person is using that anecdotal evidence to try and make a blanket claim or a universal claim about that practice's effectiveness. So let's say, I sprayed this sort of thing on my field last year and it worked great for me. Therefore, it's going to work great for you and everyone else that tries it ever. And finally, number three, and this is a big one, does this source have a financial interest in giving you this information? So can they profit over you adopting their technique? And this one's self-explanatory. If that's the case, there's always going to be the risk that they're just telling it to you so that they can make money off of it. So it doesn't mean that they're all not going to work, but always apply a healthy dose of skepticism to any sort of approach or any sort of practice or any sort of advice given to you that seems to, you know, go against any of these three guidelines. And yeah, I think that's all I got. Um, hopefully you liked the video and hopefully I can get my strawberry plants into the ground by the end of the week. This is Andy the Youngberry Farmer. Have a good one and I'll see you in the next video.